It is reported from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, and you'll find this hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, as well as another riwayah in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, the latter on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he said, speaking to the Muslims, you will surely follow the path of those before you. He continues, and listen to how he describes this following, this ittiba'a. Ba'an bi ba'in, wa bi dira'in, wa shibran bi shibrin. Fathom by fathom, cubit by cubit, hand span by hand span. Or you might say step by step, inch by inch. Hatta law dakhalu fi juhri dabbin, la dakhaltum fi. Even if they entered a lizard hole, you would follow. Qulna, ya Rasul Allah, al-Yahud wa nasara we said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, do you mean we're going to follow the Jews and Christians like this? Qala, faman idhan. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Who else? Who else? Meaning, yes, Jews and Christians, you will follow like this. You will follow down the lizard hole. As a side note, one of the major signs of the divine provenance of the Quran, uh, one of the major signs of the divine origin of the Quran, is the fact that the Jews figure so prominently in the Quranic discourse. The word Al-Yahud is mentioned nine times. The phrase Bani Israel is mentioned 41 times. The phrase al ladina Hadu is mentioned 10 times. So dozens of references. Why is this a sign? Because the Jews have always been a tiny community in terms of numbers. They were a tiny community at the time of the Prophet Wasallam with no real worldly power. Palestine was under Byzantine control and the Jews were scattered across the nations in diaspora. The Persians on the other hand, at that time were a huge powerful empire and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost never mentions the Persians. The reason seems to be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that the Zoroastrian Persians, Al-Majus, will very quickly become Muslim, almost all of them. And yet the Jews, despite their tiny numbers, will continue to be very consequential for many, many generations to come and even rise to power once again. The Quran refers to two ulu of Bani Israel at the beginning of Surah Al-Isra, also known as Surah Bani Israel. You see, the Quran is transhistorical in its guidance. The author of the Quran knows the future. So back to the hadith, we will follow the Jews and Christians even down the lizard hole. Forget about the rabbit hole. The lizard hole. So then, by examining the trends among Yehud and Nasara in our times, in terms of their theological trends, their philosophical trends, their trends and their practices, we can avoid their pitfalls, we can avoid their lizard holes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Jews and Christians, They took their religious leaders as divine lords other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their clergy, their rabbis, their monks, their popes. How? According to the statement of the Prophet sallallahu they obeyed the creation in disobedience to the Creator. And that's a problem. Manipulating the religion to fit our desires, our ahwa. That's a big problem. And yet, this is what most Jews and Christians expect from us today. You Muslims need a reformation, like our reformations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَن تَرَضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَا النَّصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَى the Jews and Christians will never be satisfied with you until you follow their form of religion. Say Allah's guidance is the only guidance. If you, Allah's addressing the Prophet ﷺ by extension, the Ummah, if you were to follow their desires, now that after all of this knowledge has come to you, then you will find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The grand example here that is so relevant in our times is Zionism. The Jewish and Christian appropriation of Zionist principles has had devastating and disastrous effects upon the world at large. Let this be a cautionary tale for us as Muslims about the importance of staying rooted in our principles and not succumbing to our desires. We must guard with our lives the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Listen to what our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Ibn Abbas was a young man at this time. Listen to this. This hadith is in Musnad Ahmad. 
عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال كنت خلف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يوما I was once behind the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا غلام احفظ الله يحفظك He said oh young man protect Allah and Allah will protect you احفظ الله تجده تجاهك Protect Allah and you will find him before you How do we protect Allah? According to the commentators, the meaning is to guard and keep his awamir and his nawahin. To guard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments and prohibitions. Tajidhu tujahaka, and you will find him before you. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you, he will aid you, he will give you strength, he will facilitate your affairs, he will bless you and give you his tawfiq. The Quran warns against ghulu, extremism. Adopting extreme or radical positions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Jews and Christians, Ya ahl al-kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum. Don't be radicals. Let's talk about the word radical. We hear this word all the time, radical Islam. We've heard this for over 20 years. But lest we forget, there's also radical Judaism and radical Christianity. And both of these are in full display right now in the world. Before I elaborate, let's come to terms. Let's define some terms. The English word radical in its origin means to pertain to the root of something, the jidr or the asal. In terms of religion, something that is radical constitutes a drastic and highly significant departure from the normative tradition. By normative, and a lot of folks nowadays are offended by this term because it sounds like normal and certain people who have certain uh, leanings in their desires or very proud during this month don't like to be characterized as abnormal. Nonetheless, despite the hurt feelings of certain individuals, Islam definitely has a normative tradition. By normative, I mean what the scriptures clearly say in their most apparent meanings, the plain and obvious meanings of the Quran and Sunnah. What is muhkam, wadih, from the kitab and Sunnah? The normative definition of a religion is what the religion clearly says about itself. Islam has a normative definition. It speaks for itself. If I showed you an image of a polygon with three angles that add up to 180 degrees, what is that? That's a triangle. It speaks for itself. Now, you can try to convince people that it's a square in some weird and confusing way, but you probably won't make a lot of converts. We have clear guidance. This is what makes Islam so attractive. The Quran is Kitab al Mubin, a book that gives clarity. By tradition, I mean something that is widely known and long-standing among a community, a practice or belief that has been passed down. The word tradition comes from the Latin, tradere, to pass down, something mawruth, inherited for generations and has enjoyed widespread acceptance. Therefore, a radical is someone who advances a drastic departure from the very root of the religion. The radical transgresses the plain and obvious meanings of the sacred text, in our case the Quran and Sunnah, or decontextualizes the sacred text and then makes some claim that has no basis or a very flimsy basis in opposition to the vast community of scholars over hundreds and hundreds of years. In other words, a radical opposes the rasikhuna fil ilm, to use the Quranic phrase, scholars who are anchored, rooted, grounded in the foundational principles of the religion. Now there are two types of tradition. This is very important. There are two types of tradition. In other words, there are two types of beliefs and practices that are passed down. And these two types may agree or disagree. And this distinction will, inshallah ta'ala, clear up a lot of confusion that people might have. Number one, religious tradition. Religious tradition is what we have inherited from our religious authorities. These are beliefs and practices that are clearly found in foundational texts and are mass transmitted and passed down to us. They are talaqi. This is our normative religious tradition. Things that have a solid basis in the Quran and Sunnah. They are obvious and axiomatic of the religion. Ma'alum min ad-din bil-durura. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi, he said that the secret of this religion, Deen islam is the sanad, the chain of transmission. We never had any ecumenical councils like the Christians, yet every Muslim in the world knows exactly what to do when he goes to Mecca for Hajj or Umrah. How? The sanad. The five daily salawat, normative religious tradition, not two, not four, not ten, everyone knows. Muslims pray five times a day, five daily salawat, clear as day in the kitab and sunnah. Another example, the ten canonical reading traditions, 
the Qiraat al-Ashar, normative uh, religious tradition, Asim, Nafi', Al-Kisai, Abu Amr, etc., etc., mass transmitted from the followers to the companions back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imagine if someone led the prayer and said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Malaka Yawm Ad Deen, Malaka Yawm Ad Deen. So he turned the noun into a verb. And then he said, Well, the Masahif Uthmaniya, the, uh, the Uthmani codices don't have any vowel notations. So I'm going to read the Rasam like this because the meaning is sound. What's the difference? No, there's no transmissional basis whatsoever for this reading. We know exactly how the Prophet ﷺ recited the Qur'an. You can't just make something up. مَنْ أَحْتَفَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْءٍ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ Whoever innovates something in this matter of ours, i.e. Islam, that has no basis, will have it rejected. Another, other examples, the belief in the Day of Judgment, prohibition of alcohol, prohibition of homosexual acts, normative religious tradition, all over the Kitab and Sunnah. Anyone who disagrees is not Muslim. It's just that simple. So that's the first type of tradition, religious tradition. The second type of tradition is called cultural tradition. These are also beliefs and practices that we've inherited. However, if some cultural practice or belief contradicts the established religious tradition, then we reject the former based upon the principle لا تعت لمخلوق في معصيات الخالق There is no obedience to creation and disobedience to the Creator. Acceptable cultural practices must fall within the parameters of religious permissibility. For example, despite what anti-Muslim charlatans on YouTube or TikTok say, honor killings, no basis in the religion, abuse of women, no basis in the religion, abuse of children, no basis in the religion, lying or cheating or being a grifter, a con man, no basis in the religion. Now in 2024, someone on the internet or in a TED talk or something on TikTok might say hijab is just cultural. Covering the head is cultural. The Quran doesn't say head anywhere. Maybe you've heard this. This is an example of a radical claim. I'm using the word radical. Why? Because this is a violation of our mass transmitted normative religious tradition which is firmly established upon the plain and obvious meanings of our sacred text. So what are we now to believe? That for 1400 years, hundreds of thousands of scholars, men and women, who mastered dozens of disciplines, all misread the Quran, but some journalism major from Yale or Columbia, who took two semesters of Arabic, was able to figure it out last week. Amazing. MashaAllah. This makes a mockery of the religion. We know what hijab is. We don't need some radical revisionist to muddy the waters. The, mutter, the waters are crystal clear. The hijab covers the head, the neck, and the chest area. The style or color of the hijab. Ah, these are cultural. Go to different countries, you'll see different styles and colors. But hijab is hijab. It's ma'loom. But do you see how this shubha was created? A lack of knowledge of Quranic lugha, Quranic terminology. A lack of knowing the sabab al nuzul the historical contextualization of this ayah, and then failing to distinguish between religious and cultural tradition. A shubha, by the way, is something that resembles the truth. The verb shabaha means to resemble something. A shubha masquerades as truth. An average person with limited knowledge might be persuaded by it, but in reality it is falsehood. The Prophet ﷺ said that the imposter Messiah, the Antichrist, will cause many Muslims to go astray because the imposter messiah is an expert at raising shubuhat, pseudo verities, confusing people by implanting doubt. Speaking of the Antichrist, let's bring it back to Zionism. The most consequential example of adopting a radical position that I can think of is the Jewish and Christian adoption of Zionism. In other words, a Zionist reading of the Bible is a radical reading of the Bible. It is essentially a modern, Eurocentric, settler, colonial reading of the Bible. It is to read and interpret the Bible through the lens of Zionist principles. Imagine reading the Bible through the lens of Nazi principles or Marxist principles. It is to depart from long-standing biblical exegesis and its normative tradition. It is to deviate from the Jama'ah in order to fulfill one's worldly desires. We know that inherent within European settler colonialism, is the continuous, continuous dispossession 
of the indigenous population through ethnic cleansing, either genocide or for forced expulsion. Ethnic cleansing is inherent in Zionism. That's a quote from Dr. Uh, Rashid Khalidi. Dr. Benny Morris, former professor at Ben Gurion University in Israel, he's the author of several books, a Zionist himself. He said that the idea of transfer is inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. Transfer is an Orwellian euphemism for expulsion or ethnic cleansing. Inbuilt and inevitable. Now Zionism has two horns, secular and pseudo-religious. Secular Zionism throws the Torah and its tradition in the garbage and redefines a Jew primarily along racial lines. It's race over religion. Zionism as a settler colonial project was founded by atheists. I think it was Elon Pape who once quipped, most Zionists don't believe that God exists, but they do believe that he promised them Palestine. Coming from an Israeli. So those are the secular Jewish Zionists. But what, what is the radical position of the religious Jewish, Jewish Zionists? For the religious Jewish Zionists, the Zionist movement constitutes what's known as the Had Chalata Ga'ula in Hebrew, the beginning of the messianic redemption. That is to say, Zionism is an acceptable means by which God will bring about the Jewish redemption under the Messiah. This is a deviation at best, blasphemy at worst. Therefore, for the religious Jewish Zionists, a Jew may no longer remain diasporic. He can now reject the traditional idea of a divinely decreed indefinite exile from the Holy Land. What's the result? Come make Aliyah to the West Bank and continue to contribute to the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. Now, what do I mean by divinely decreed indefinite exile? So before the blasphemy of religious Jewish Zionism, not Zionism which is called Tzionot Datit in Hebrew, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, almost 2,000 years, most Jews the world over believed based upon explicit muhkamat texts in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, that their exile from the Holy Land was justified, that it was divinely decreed due to their disobedience, Jewish disobedience. This was the most prevalent traditional understanding among Jews. In other words, the Holy Land, the Promised Land, was given on condition. This is extremely important. It was conditional. Obey God or else the land will reject you and God will thrust you out. This wa'id, this threat, is stated dozens of times in the Tanakh. It's all over the place. Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. It's all over the place. So according to, the most, according to most traditional authorities, no one other than God, by means of the Messiah, can initiate a return to the Holy Land. No one other than God, by means of the Messiah, can reestablish a Jewish nation, kingdom, or homeland. They must wait patiently for the Messiah. Or as Maimonides said in his principle number 12 of his 13 principles of Jewish faith in his Mishnah Torah, I believe with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah. And even if he should tarry, I nevertheless will wait every day for his coming. The Jews are under a 2,000 year divinely mandated diaspora. This is what almost all Jews believed prior to 150 years ago. This is Judaism in its most widely taught tradition. Of course, there were exceptions. Extremists like Nachmanides, not Maimonides, Nachmanides. But for the majority, any attempt to reestablish any land through military means in lieu of the Messiah was viewed as kufr, as rebellion against God. Even if there's some uninhabited island the size of a football stadium in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Jewish people have no right to it whatsoever, according to the majority of the traditional Orthodox, the Charedim of their own tradition. One of the most famous anti-Zionist rabbis was Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan. He was a famous halakist, a jurist. He died in 1933. <clears throat> this is what he said, the, quote, the Zionists are the dead limbs of our people which cause the entire body to rot. In other words, these Zionists are making trouble for all of us. Their fitna is affecting all of us. They're giving Judaism a bad name. The anti-Zionist traditional Orthodox say Israel is not a Jewish nation, it's an abomination. They say Yehudi Lotzioni. This is their mantra in Hebrew, Yehudi Lotzioni, a true Jew is not a Zionist. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they're not all the same. 
But unfortunately, it gets even worse. According to the radical religious Jewish Zionists, God promised the Holy Land to the sons of Jacob. And so it is the duty of his descendants to not only initiate a return to the land, to seize the Holy Land and break the exile, but to continuously implement in every generation the various mitzvot or commandments in the Torah that are particular to the Holy Land. So what mitzvot am I talking about? Mitzvah number seven, uh, 528, to commit cherem of non-Jews from the river to the sea. We should know this term, cherem. It's a hard che, H-E-R-E-M, cherem. What does that mean? Genocide, ethnic cleansing. Mitzvah number 604, to exterminate Amalek, whom high-ranking Israeli officials have explicitly identified as the Palestinians. Gradual and continuous annihilation of men, women, children, and animals. This is radical Judaism. And this is what we're seeing right now as innocent men, women, and children are being burned alive at refugee camps in Rafah. Most traditional Jews have very different ways of dealing with these mitzvot in the Torah. So let's see what happened. Listen closely. These violent verses in the Torah that most traditional authorities consider to be highly contingent and limited in their application, okay? These verses were suddenly universalized by a few Ashkenazic rabbis, European rabbis, in the 20th century in order to harmonize the Torah with the principles of Zionism, to accommodate Zionism. But then to justify themselves religiously, they would find these minority opinions like the extreme opinions of Nachmanides, who advocated continuous, unrelenting cherem, genocide, in the Holy Land, from the river to the sea in every generation. To put it simple, Judaism plus Zionism equals radical Judaism. When we look back at Islamic conquest, we see something very different. The indigenous were allowed to live in their homes and practice their religion and customs. The Zoroastrians who didn't convert survived in Iran. The Christians survive in North Africa to this day. There's millions of them. The Jews thrived in Muslim countries for centuries. If they convert to Islam, they convert. If not, they pay a tribute tax if they can afford it. And they're guaranteed protection from the Muslim polity. This is called dhimmi status, protected status. Genocide, ethnic cleansing are against the principles of Islamic conquest. <coughs> we have this <coughs> concept of Ahl al-Kitab, protected minority status. Were there injustices committed by certain Muslims? Yes. But these were in breach of the Sharia. By contrast, ethnic cleansing is inherent in Zionism. To quote Dr. Khalidi again, ethnic cleansing is in the DNA of Zionism. According to Khalidi, protected minority status was completely contradictory to the aims of Zionism. Why? Because the whole point of Zionism is not to have goyim, that's the whole point, not to have Gentiles. It's der Judenstaat, the Jewish state. So Zionism is a betrayal of the Old Testament teaching. But here's where it gets even more disturbing. Zionism is also a betrayal of the New Testament teaching. It is a betrayal of biblical Christianity. According to the clear teachings of the New Testament and the, an established Christian tradition, the Jews are no longer the chosen people. The New Testament clearly advances replacement theology. This is also called covenantal supersessionism. Supersessionism is this idea that the Christian church has superseded the nation of Israel as God's covenant people. Of course, this is not a total replacement because Jews can still believe in Jesus and they must believe in Jesus if they want to remain God's people. That's traditional Christianity. Now, Christian Zionists, they love to quote Genesis 12:3. Where God says to Abraham, I will bless him that blesses you and curse him that curses you. So they take this to mean that they must bless and support the modern day of Israel, the modern state of Israel, or else God will curse them. This is what they say. Where are they getting this from? A recent shubha called dispensationalism. This is not biblical. They were hoodwinked. They were duped. Just recently, perhaps you heard about this, a duped congressman from uh, Georgia was questioning the president of Columbia University. Right? This was in the context of the pro-Palestine campus encampments. He asked the president of Columbia, uh, President Shafiq, he said, quote, are you familiar with Genesis 12, 3? She said, probably not as much as you are. Then he said, oh, it says, if you bless Israel, I will bless you. 
if you curse Israel, I will curse you. Do you want Columbia University to be cursed by God? Christian Zionists, like this ignorant congressman, say Christians have a religious duty to love and support Israel. This totally contradicts the New Testament. Just read the letters of Paul of Tarsus. 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, almost half, are explicitly attributed to him. And Paul is a supersessionist to his very core. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3.16 about God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12.3. So Paul explicitly comments on Genesis 12.3. The Christian Zionists summarily ignore him. Ajib. Here's what he says. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And here the Christian Zionist says, Amen. But Paul continues, Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. According to Paul, God in Genesis was specifically referring to Jesus Christ as being Abraham's seed. Only Jesus and those who believe in him are blessed, not the disbelieving Israelites, and certainly not the modern genocidal, blasphemous, apartheid, ethno state of Israel founded by atheists. Paul goes on to say, Galatians 3, 28, 29, conditional statement, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So believers in Jesus are the new chosen people according to the New Testament. It's crystal clear. You're only chosen and blessed if you believe in Jesus. Religious Jews do not believe in Jesus, to put it kindly. And secular Jews, forget about Jesus, most of them don't even believe in God. My point is, if New Testament believing Christians would just follow their tradition, they would not support Zionism. They would not be war hawking for Israel and supporting genocide. Millions upon millions of Christian Zionists supported the invasion of Iraq 20 years ago. I remember it well for theological reasons, because it was in Israel's best interest. What is Israel's best interest? It's all laid out. It's all on the internet. The Yinon Plan. Look it up. Yinon Plan of 1982, also called the Greater Israel Project. Of course, the American public was sold a pack of lies about WMDs. Absolutely disgraceful. A quarter of a million innocent Iraqis murdered probably more. How many Afghan families were murdered? We had these Christian Zionist leaders and preachers on television with millions of followers stoking hatred for Arabs, hatred for Muslims, offering these half-witted, asinine, futuristic interpretations of biblical verses which they claim were referring to Saddam Hussein and Iraq and these types of things. Total nonsense. All for the glory and protection of Israel. War hawking for Israel by means of bad theology. War hawking for Israel by means of bad theology. This is a murderous ideology. Christian Zionism is a murderous, extremist, radical ideology. Who says that? Dr. Steven Sizer. Dr. Sizer is a Bible-believing Christian. He wrote a book called Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon. And that's exactly what it is. It's a roadmap to Armageddon. As, thesis of, uh, uh, as theists of normative religion, we don't want Armageddon. We don't want to see the fitna of the end of days. It's the worst fitna in human history. No one but a psychopath wants to hasten that fitna. How did Zionism become so popular among the Protestants in particular? We don't have time. I'm out of time. But it's a fascinating history. It involves men named John Nelson Darby and Clarence Larkin and James Hall Brooks, C.I. Schofield. It, in it involves a book called the Schofield Study Bible, infamous Bible. It involves a radical eschatology. Radical. Radical not as in good. That's radical. No, no, no. Called modern dispensationalism. It involves a radical theology called dual covenant theology. This is what happens when tradition is ignored and people follow their desires. This is your reformation. Ya Ahl al-Kitab. In conclusion, my respected brothers and sisters in Islam, know your tradition. Fastaqim kama umirt. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands. Stand firm as you have been commanded. Hold fast to our principles. Be committed, mind, body, and soul to our beautiful, robust, and time-tested tradition. We don't need to reform. We need to re-inform. Take a lesson from Ahl al-Kitab. Disobeying Allah to chase kuffar down lizard holes only leads to major fitna and fasad upon the earth. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم توبوا إلى الله وتوبوا عليه